I'm Kevin Benedict, Senior Analyst for Digital Transformation here in beautiful Orlando, Florida with Ved Sin, my colleague. Ved, you've got new roles here with 20, in 2015. What's your new responsibilities? Um, I'm sort of uh, moved a little bit upstream from looking at mobile to now looking at digital strategy, digital transformation, um, really in a more technology neutral manner because we find the biggest challenges our clients are facing is that they see the vision but they don't know how to build a roadmap to get there. What do we do on Monday morning to kick us off in that direction of achieving the Code Halo world that we talk about? So Gata, let's talk about some of these acronyms we've been using and some of yes. these terms here. Let's start right out by talking about digital transformation. What does that mean to the viewer? I think it basically means that the way companies go to market, the way they engage with customers, uh, the way they run their operations are all going to fundamentally change uh, I would even say that for a lot of companies, the amount of technology that goes into the product itself is going to change. And that really means that we are on the cusp of, you know, what is the next industrial revolution? I mean, the, the companies that we see today, um, in 10, 15, 20 years time, will be unrecognizable from the way they have been over the last 50 years or so. So what is transforming companies? What are the external kind of forces that are changing and creating this digital transformation wave? I think it's primarily the, the fact that technology has reached a tipping point where it has become extremely user friendly and I've just written about this so sort of my thinking is that technology is not diverse, we are able to handle diversity whereas previously technology was all about conformity. We took a process and we wanted everyone to follow the process so we built a software that replicated the process and we forced people to use it in companies especially. Now we're saying it doesn't matter, you and I are doing the same thing but we do it fundamentally differently and that's fine. And we can wrap technology around that so you can work in your way and I can work in my way and release the best of our creative uh, and functional capabilities. Mm. At the same time, the technology supports us equally well without blinkering us into one way of doing things. So if the technology is available to be uh, for people to be creative with. That's a very important part. And to be able to use all these components that already exist. Yep. So that not only does it allow us to be creative, but agile. Yes. Uh, and I imagine there's a lot of emphasis on the cloud in this kind of scenario. Absolutely. We, we talk about, you know, when you ask the question of digital transformation, a big part of that transformation is the infrastructure that supports the transformation. That has many layers, but one critical layer is the cloud because it simply enables us to make technology available to people wherever, whenever. Uh, when you think about using Spotify, when you think about using Evernote, you don't think about where it's stored, how am I going to access it, you just pull out a device and you start listening to music. And the cloud is sort of a hidden element of that, but it is fundamentally important in enabling us to actually get to that point where you can really not have to worry as a user about where my access is, how am I going to access it, you know, how yeah, where because does information reside. Because rather than going through this whole process of bidding and looking at implementation, processes it's really a subscription of an existing service absolutely and then you can take a look at all the existing services and then what it does really is it puts the onus back on strategy if you've got a strategy there's a lot of technology available to help you deliver it isn't there this is true um, but I'm gonna be a little bit counterintuitive a little bit and and again this is my recent thinking um, around digital transformation is that we're also now learning that the, the technology and business um, and, and the user is in an interplay and so it's not you know traditionally what we used to do is we would think it through and then put in the technology to support our strategy now we're saying you have a sort of strategic vision but very early in the game we need to put the technology into the into the hands of the users because the user now is an integral part of the journey of the evolution of the product so you know if you look at LinkedIn or, or Spotify all the, all these technologies Evernote, I mean, I love the Evernote example because at its heart, it is a very primitive use case. Mm -hmm. It's taking notes. Yep. That's all it's doing. And yet, such a simple thing, uh, it has been able to become successful by taking market share away from companies like Microsoft, who you thought would be, you know, all over the space. Right. So, so what it is, is that very early in the game, in this digital transformation, you've got to give the user a tool and, and we come to the agile MVP kind of thinking mm -hmm. there and lean thinking, which is give the user something that is... Uh, simple, but not incomplete. And this is a very important okay. part. Okay, simple and but not incomplete. Simple but not incomplete, and where user experience is non-negotiable. Okay. 
Okay, if you get these three things right, and, and I think there's a danger that in lean and agile thinking we trivialize or oversimplify the, the idea of MVP. Uh, that is not, MVP thinking is not a necessarily a simplification. And what do you mean by that? The, the, the minimum viable product, the minimum okay. viable version of your product, the, the smallest bundle of functionalities that will make this product simple and complete. Um, but the challenge is that that's not hard for large enterprises. If you were building a new startup, you have one kind of challenge. But for a large enterprise, the biggest challenge is this thinking needs you to be very, very user-centric. So you've mm -hmm. got to start thinking user backwards rather than process outwards. Okay. Uh, and now if I want to take a simple process, if I want to um, simplify, let's say, the way I sign up new clients in a bank, customer onboarding, the challenge is that any of these one journeys for the user actually touches multiple processes mm -hmm. in the organization. So it's, it's perhaps an oversimplification to say, oh, you know, just, just be user-centric and just push out an MVP or a minimum viable product. The challenge is for, for large companies that does involve a political, operational, structural challenge mm -hmm. because you're talking about different departments, different functionalities, different processes and potentially different back-end technologies now suddenly having to be impacted and changed to make this one simple customer journey go better. But one of the things that makes it possible today and it, in the past when it wouldn't have been possible is that these components exist out there in the cloud already. A lot Many of them, of them you can test and yes. try. I mean think back 10 years what would have happened? You would have had to for us for for a small group and a proof of concept you would have had to actually implement all these systems Absolutely. in a manner that provided a minimum viable product. Absolutely. Today you can do that relatively easy through digital transformation. Absolutely. I mean, the big leap that technology has made is, as you say, um, it has become unbundled, if you will. Mm -hmm. It is possible now uh, with a very minimal cost footprint to run a, a, a small minimum viable product kind of proposition and get it out there. I mean, the best examples I can think of is, is talking to, you know, listen to people like, um, um, you know, even whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's even people like, uh, um, you know, the guys who were um, behind Spotify. Mm -hmm. All of these guys, if you look at their starting point is tiny. It's, yes. it's three developers and two months and it's out of the door. Mm -hmm. And that's possible today, even for a large enterprise. It, it exists, the platforms exist. You don't need to buy servers. You don't need to buy infrastructure. You don't need to buy enormous amounts of talent. So I, I see this as one of those evolutions which is actually unbundling creativity. Yes. You it can do so bundled. much, you can do so much transformation in so many different areas for not a lot of money, in a lot of speed. It makes it, management is going to be an issue. Absolutely. I, I think the, the it, it's not that, uh, you know, sometimes we make it sound and, and people like us, um, we, 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 because we bang the drum about digital transformation and disruption, we make it sound easy. And I think it's important that we recognize that while a lot of the technology challenges have become simpler, the battleground has shifted. Mm. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy. It's just that disruption by itself has a big cultural footprint. And disruption conversations are difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I find that the biggest challenge is no longer the technology, because we just right. discussed. And I would agree with that. Yeah, It is actually the ability to have constructive dissent um, in large organizations where you can challenge each other, whether you, where, where you can come out with outcomes that actually are able to have walked through that valley of, of discontent uh, that, that people will face because they are challenged in the way they think existing in an existing environment. They are challenged in the way they run their existing processes, which are, I'm sure, quite successful. And we're saying, actually, you know, turn this a different way. And I think the culture of, of digital transformation is a really important piece that tends to get neglected. Uh, and the other piece I would think is, you know, uh, this ability to actually um, find those inflection points between when something uh, uh, which has been launched as a small initiative, when it's working, how can we scale it quickly? Mm -hmm. And if it's not working, how can we either flip or kill it? See, in the past, technology and innovation was controlled and managed top down. Yes. So decisions were made and projects were initiated. But with the technology and the digital transformation today, and I'll use the word again, the consumerization of IT, you have the ability to quickly create really innovative tools and Absolutely. apps at the gra grass level. Yes. Grassroots level, I should say. And so the management now needs to look at that and say, how do we filter that, organize it, put it into a system that enables and scales to the whole company? Absolutely, and I think um, in, in that kind of discussion, um, lies what is one of the fundamental aspects of digital transformation, which is 
where do you start? Because, you know, transformation conceptually sounds obvious, but a starting point is incredibly hard to find. And I think we are again used to a world where we, when we start a journey, we necessarily see the end point. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find, what I think is very fascinating is that we don't actually find too many companies that have completed this process. So the other thinking that I have is that digital transformation is not a one-time activity. It is not a single, it is not one large project. It is actually a series of maybe hundreds of transformations. Mm. And, and potentially you have, to, you have to buy into the fact that it may, never, it may not change um, over the foreseeable future. You, you may not have an end point of digital transformation. You may be in transformation mode for maybe the next five, seven, ten years. Absolutely. So now let me highlight some of these transformational areas. Social. Absolutely. Mobile. Mm -hmm. The analytics, big data, etc. Cloud computing. Absolutely. The Internet of Things. Sensors, yes. Building things like gamification into those processes. Those are some of the specific things that we mean by digital transformation. And then how creative can you get with all those things? Correct. I, I would call exactly the set of things you identified is the, they're your toolkit. That's mm -hmm. what's in your toolbox. Uh, what problems you solve with that toolkit is the other side. Yes. So then you can say, using these tools, I can solve the problem of customer retention. I can solve the problem of straight through processing. I can solve the problem of claims management and insurance. And we're seeing that all over the place. Our clients are doing it, we're doing it, we're seeing startups do it. And, and I think it is all about being, um, being able to engage uh, in a, as I said, I think the, the critical thing is constructive dissent. Uh, because we're going to challenge, we're going to go oh, yeah. in and say, you know, what you're doing is great, but it's not going to survive the next five years. And this is a very hard thing for a lot of our clients, a lot of, uh, for ourselves mm -hmm. sometimes to accept that what has worked so well is not going to work again. And Ved, I would suggest also that it's the location in which interactions happen. So let's use the word location. Instead of location being, meaning on high street in some retail front store, those interactions now could be out here amongst the palm trees in Orlando on a mobile device. Absolutely. So you're buying things, you're shopping, you're doing your personal banking, you're trading in the markets, you're, you're communicating with your team, all can be done wherever that location has now moved. Absolutely. So it's really saying, how can you take all of these really valuable functions and let them go anywhere and everywhere with you? Yeah, I mean, one way to express that, I just it's interesting you say that because one way to express that is to say, look, we are now location independent. Mm -hmm. Another way to express that is that the location has gotten virtualized. Um, I can actually create a virtual location as well. Mm -hmm. And the third way to express that is that location now has become a critical data point because the kind of things I can offer you and the way I can deal with the customer may well vary on your location. Oh, and yeah. the location becomes one more customer-driven data point. Earlier, the location was a vendor data point. I would have to come to your store, to your website, to your environment to do the transaction. And now we're saying, through the kind of structures we're seeing emerge, a user need not come to your website, need not come to your app, but may, may still be transacting with you. So even in the virtual environment, you've got different kinds of location absolutely and and that is an important data point that we must plug plug back into our code halo so that and that you mentioned a word earlier which was code halo yes now right in the building behind us is two things there's a Pete's coffee and there's a Starbucks coffee I have a Starbucks app that I use on my iPhone Starbucks today knows I'm in Orlando because absolutely. I use my app absolutely Delta Airlines knows I'm here Marriott knows I'm here. All this data is now being handled by companies that I do transactions with. Absolutely. What possibly, uh, what possible use could they have of that data? I think um, the, you know, this this is, goes back to again. I'll refer the core halo model, and one of the things that it, it sort of enshrines is this idea of give to get. Mm -hmm. Now you've given your data to all these companies. You will only continue to do that. If they can give you back something in return, yes. that makes it worthwhile. Yes. Uh, and and if there is a special blend of coffees that's only available in Orlando, hypothetically speaking, that that Starbucks could give you, you would think it was worthwhile to share that data. Mm -hmm. If all they did was push the same, you know, messaging, the same offers, that is, is independent of this data, you'd say, why did I share my location? And you mm -hmm. might find it intrusive. So it's important to focus on this give to get data to say, for each piece of data that I'm getting, what am I giving to the customer that is valuable? So let me just jump in there and say, so there's Pete's Coffee and there's Starbucks Coffee all connected in the same building. 
But Starbucks, I have an app. I don't have a Pete's app. Maybe Pete's has an app, but I don't have it. But Starbucks, every 15th drink is going to give me a free drink. That's one part. <laughs> and the second so I want to go there. Absolutely. And the second part is Starbucks knows you're here. Maybe Starbucks has, you know, uh, 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 you know, you, you've sort of gone to the Starbucks here and yes. that's why they've discovered that you're here. Yes. Now what if you allow Starbucks to, to you know, uh, read your location anyway? You may not even know there's a Starbucks here. You may be yes. dying for a Starbucks coffee and yet you don't know where the Starbucks is. Starbucks doesn't know where you are. Yes. And, and that's a market that needs to be created. So location itself becomes a marketplace. And yep. if you think of location as a marketplace, I have something to give, which is my, my data. Uh, you have something to buy. So which that's is, a transaction. It's a transaction. It's yep. a data transaction. An exchange of my data for your content. Absolutely. Now we're staying here at the JW Marriott and I noticed coming in it says there's mobile check-in. Yes. That's another example where if you have the Marriott app, you can just tell them, look, I'm here, here's my preferences, etc. And they will already have your kit at the counter and just hand it Absolutely. to you. Again, just saving some valuable time and reducing the line or lines or the queues. Yeah, I, I think the point of a lot of uh, digital technologies is to actually bring down transaction costs. Mm -hmm. Because without realizing it, we do spend a lot of time and effort, if not money, mm -hmm. in, in simple transactions. Yes. So this whole check-in process could take 10 minutes of your life that you will never get back. And if that becomes two minutes of your life, then you, you know, that adds up. Absolutely. Let me just add to that and say that the Marriott checked in 700 people yesterday. Yeah. So at the front desk, I was talking to the lady at the front desk, 700 check-ins yesterday. She said when she worked at the Marriott in Peru, they had like seven pieces of original documents and copies they had to do for every person that checked in. She said that kind of volume would have been impossible Absolutely. in the Marriott in um, Peru simply because of the paperwork required in that country to bring in Absolutely. foreign uh, foreign visitors. But here, you just push a button and you're checked in. That's, that's the transaction cost. Exactly, and that's because a lot of the a lot of the information that is stored in the document is, is already available yeah. in this transaction. We are just taking away the, the constraints of the physical nature of that transaction. And we know that digital transactions are much faster. So, you know, that, that's a given. Awesome. I want to thank you for joining Ved. I want to thank you again for your wisdom and your insights and sharing with all of us. And thank you for watching.